last time on 30 Minute Thesis, I discussed all the interesting ways in which Sir Roger Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology could revolutionize our understanding of cosmology and even the origin of the universe. But I neglected to mention all the ways that Sir Roger could be wrong, and ways that we could prove him wrong would actually be almost as enticing as if his theory is right. This video explains the experimental techniques my colleagues and I are working on to explore ways to not prove him right, but prove him wrong. Come along. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So we built BICEP, we took it to Antarctica, we measured the uh, imprimatur of the early universe. Here's a, a picture from the Washington Post, which shows kind of this cartoon of an explosion being uh, the process of inflation, producing a background of gravitational waves, which shake up and reverberate the cosmic microwave background's last scattering surface, imprinting upon it the imprimatur of inflation, namely, Inflation occurs, then the universe will have a background of tensor modes, gravitational waves, like a gas suffusing the entire universe. It will exist at 380,000 years after the Big Bang. It will cause a twisting, curling pattern of microwaves called B-mode polarization that is observable today. And that's what we set out to do. How does it work? Well, BICEP and all these polarimeters detect the polarization. One of the properties of light that is most remarkable is that it is possible for the wave of electromagnetic radiation to oscillate preferentially along one axis. That's called linear polarization. So unpolarized light, say from the sun, can come and bounce off the ocean surface, as it does here in La Jolla quite frequently. And there you can see some glare from reflections off the sea surface. And it can become polarized. And that polarization is due to suppression of one of the two linear polarization modes. Then with a polarimeter, namely your eyes, uh, with a tiny lens and a retina detector replacing a CCD camera, uh, you can use this polarizing sunglasses uh, pair to modulate and subtract out one of the two polarization modes, thus giving you glare-free vision. So that's a simple polarimeter. Here's an illustration from Wayne Hugh, a colleague and friend of mine at the University of Chicago, that shows how matter and light can interact, producing a polarized signal from an initially unpolarized signal. And that will result in B modes if the universe possessed gravitational wave energy at the time of last scatter. So we built BICEP 2, we built BICEP 1, took it down to the South Pole in 2005. The South Pole is the dead center of Antarctica. So getting to Antarctica is quite a, a journey, but the actual uh, destination at the South Pole is quite striking, uh, and all the more so for it having been the site in which we detected, at least the claimed detection for the first time falsifying conformal cyclic cosmology, the, uh, the quasi-steady state theory, and also the bouncing models. Now, of course, we all know that my book is titled Losing the Nobel Prize, not Winning the Nobel Prize. So despite making this announcement, which was exactly the image predicted and shown from the Washington Post here, we discovered the exact real data signal shown here. This is not a simulation. This B-mode polarization map led to many, many uh, uh, headlines around the world, including the newspaper of record, that is the San Diego Union Tribune, of course, but also in this New York Times. You see it above the fold, as they say, even made The Economist, made it onto CNN. It was a media storm. We had uh, viral videos with three million views on YouTube. Uh, Andre Linde being informed that we've detected the uh, earliest evidence for inflationary cosmology. We also, pertinent to Sir Roger Penrose, claimed by him to have detected what are known as hawking points. I'll have more to say about that in a future video. Suffice it to say that this evidence has also kind of gone away, uh, but it's interesting to note the conclusions on that very day, that famous day in, in 2014 when we made the announcement at Harvard Center for Astrophysics. The uh, announcement went out all around the world, not only that everybody was going to win Nobel Prizes for all, but that we had now shown evidence for the first time for the multiverse. Here's an article written by my good friend and past guest, Max Tegmark. Good morning, inflation. Hello, multiverse. So again, if you detect primordial waves of gravity, then you would have reason to have cred credulity in the inflationary universe's origin. If inflation took place, you have reason to think that the multiverse is true. So the stakes could not be higher. And of course, as I've talked about in previous uh, episodes uh, and my talks at Google and my TEDx talk, etc., the universe is not so kind always and we couldn't stop thinking about that cosmic interstellar dust. 
And eventually it all went down to dust. Eden sank to dust, as I talk about in losing the Nobel Prize. So the universe isn't this pristine looking glass, uh, clear looking glass that you can see all the way back to the origin of the universe. Instead, it's quite smoggy. So nothing gold can stay. This Nobel laureate Robert Frost opined uh, that Eden sank to grief and nothing gold could stay. So the Nobel Prize didn't stay, at least for me, and probably uh, best that it didn't, <laughs> given my criticisms of it. Uh, but uh, another person who uh, was nominated for the Nobel Prize uh, and uh, yet did not win it is Mahatma Gandhi, who invoked in us a, a clear call, a clarion call, that the seeker after truth should be humbler than the dust. The world crushes the dust under its feet, but the seeker after truth should so humble himself that even the dust could crush him. Only then, and not until then, will he have a glimpse of truth. Now, this is in his book or his poems and writings on experiments with truth. Now, I'm an experimental cosmologist. So what do we do? We need to build a new experiment that can see dust and see the cosmic microwave background B-mode polarization signals, if they exist, subtract the dust from the total signal, and what is left should be the pristine evidence that might invalidate conformal cyclic cosmology, bouncing cosmology, and, of course, the uh, quasi-steady state cosmology. So we're doing that. The Simons Observatory, uh, with, uh, which I lead with my colleagues Suzanne Staggs, Adrian Lee, and Mark Devlin. Uh, we are building this observatory with our students, colleagues, and friends, partners around the world, 300 strong, building an amazing uh, observatory in the Atacama Desert of northern Chile. So how do you get rid of the dust? Well, you just suck it up. You build a giant space sucker. No, we're not doing that. We're actually building an experiment that's capable of seeing both the small scale fluctuations in the microwave background that are indicative of the formation of galaxies, the evolution of dark energy, if that takes place, uh, the distribution of dark matter, but also measuring uh, the B mode polarization at large angular scales, just like BICEP and BICEP2, but with multiple frequencies. And I should say the BICEP team is also going about their business in what's known as the BICEP array, building multi frequency, multi polarization sensitive detectors. I will produce a video about how these experiments work, but for now, I'll just remind you that we're going after these primordial B modes, which will occur if they exist, if inflation took place, if the multiverse is true, they will exist at large scales and that will allow us to falsify these competitive mo models that don't feature this primordial hyper expansion faster than the speed of light as we've talked about in previous videos about inflation, the inflation crash course, for example. We'll have three small aperture telescopes in the Simons Observatory that will allow us to see in six different frequency channels, several to guard against dust and several to measure uh, synchrotron radiation, which is a lower frequency phenomenon, and then several to measure the CMB signals alone if inflation took place, these primordial B modes would be produced. So here in San Diego, we're building the birthday present that maybe perhaps Sir Roger would not be so happy to receive. And shown here are my students and, and postdocs and collaborators working on one of the small uh, aperture telescopes that will be one of the first to deploy to our site in Chile. Here's a schematic of it. Uh, shown here, produced by my ex outstanding postdoc, Dr. Nicholas Galitsky. The Simons Observatory uses these focal planes uh, designed and optimized by Suzanne Staggs, who's our spokesperson at Princeton University. These are magical devices that work at 100 milli-degrees above uh, zero Kelvin, so 0.1 Kelvin, colder by far than interstellar space. And she's assembled these and packaged these with her teammates to make the most sensitive cosmic microwave background focal planes ever devised. We've made great progress. We've poured down some foundations and built a site with our own concrete delivered from far away. So where does this leave us? Can we ever prove that inflation took place? No, we can't. Can we ever prove that the universe has eons or cycles or bounces, etc.? No, but we can falsify these models if they're not correct and if inflation is correct. So it's kind of different. It's a different situation to be in than many other tests that we've talked about on this channel, many other ob observations. We can prove inflation's competitors. We can prove them wrong, but we can't necessarily prove inflation right. I've talked about in my video, The Faith of a Physicist, that I don't believe in gravity and uh, talked about notions of belief versus evidence. Here's a quote from my friend Paul Davies. The multiverse, which is part of concomitant hand in hand with inflation, may be dressed up in scientific language, but it requires the same leap of faith as a belief in an unseen creator. 
The last thing I'll say is that the universe of Sir Roger Penrose deals with this very, very vexing problem of entropy that we talked about in my video, Cracking the Cosmic Egg. That video discussed the origin of entropy in a low entropy state and how it could then evolve to higher and higher entropy and not have to make use of an imposition by fiat as many call what's known as the past hypothesis. Many physicists find that distasteful as eating some of these eggs shown in these egg cracking failures. But uh, of course, Sir Roger was one of the first to point this out 30 years ago almost, that the universe evolving to higher and higher entropy today meant that it must have been an extraordinarily low entropy in the deep, deep past. And so the uh, statement by Paul Steinhardt shown here from his Scientific American article shows that the number of inflationary models that actually work and produce a low entropy start to the universe are exceptionally low almost so low as to require the imposition by fiat. Now you could say fiat is kind of like uh, the Latin translation, the motto of the University of California where I am. Fiat lux, let there be light, means that's what God said. So is this somehow, again, another kind of uh, shout out to religion in that the past hypothesis specifies by fiat the imposition of low entropy conditions? I'm not gonna talk much about religion on this channel in these videos. However, it is interesting to note that this is exceptionally rare. And again, it's another uncomfortable truth, an inconvenient truth, as Nobel laureate Al Gore would say. So is there a last word from Sir Roger? Does he have any hope of having a successful, happy uh, 90th birthday and beyond? Well, he visited me here not too long ago at UC San Diego. Here he is, not far from where the Small Aperture Telescope that I just showed is being assembled. This was right before uh, the global pandemic erupted. But I have great high hopes that not necessarily will we see the imprimatur of what he calls these hawking points, which are the remnants of black holes that somehow make it through uh, the Big Bang of one universe into the Big Bang of another universe. He claims to have detected evidence for this. Researchers don't uh, suggest with very high likelihood any sufficient evidence to claim detection of hawking points as Sir Roger and his colleagues have asserted. I think the jury's still out. We'd like to get more data on this. It doesn't look good right now for Hawking points, but that doesn't mean that conformal cyclic cosmology is falsified. A better test would be a detection of primordial gravitational waves, but again, that requires that inflation took place. So in conclusion, we have many different reasons to suspect that the universe has peculiar properties, properties that cry out for explanation. Whether those explanations come from a universe that had a cyclical, eon-like behavior of Sir Roger Penrose, or whether it had an eternal multiverse behavior of Linde and Guth and others, or whether it expands and collapses in a bouncing scenario, that has yet to be seen. But the key point is, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So I wish Sir Roger Penrose a happy 90th birthday. Here's to many more birthdays celebrated together and never stop searching. For now, Brian Keating, Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Physics at the University of California and co-director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, thanking you for going into the impossible. If you enjoyed this video, you definitely want to check out this playlist with my cosmology friends talking about the origin and evolution of the universe. And if you're interested in a deep dive in the multiverse, wormholes, and other exotic phenomena, click here and hear my conversation with Juan Maldacena of the Institute for Advanced Study. Enjoy! And don't forget to subscribe for more amazing content.